Hey everyone, uh, I'm Tom Carrico. I'm a senior fellow in the International Security Program here at CSIS, and I direct our, our missile defense project. Uh, before we begin big events like this, we want to just remind folks, uh, just in case there's some uh, need to exit, in the unlikely event of an emergency or something, we want to you know, just let you know about the exits uh, to the back, the stairways, and then also the exits uh, on the other side. We're excited to be here today um, for the latest installment of the Maritime Security Dialogue. Uh, this is co-hosted by CSIS and the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, and this dialogue seeks to highlight current thinking and future challenges facing the U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. Today's event is our sixth dialogue uh, this year, and we look forward to having such, uh, to have you join us for future events as well. We want to thank both Lockheed Martin and Huntington Ingalls Industries for their support uh, to the Maritime Security Dialogue, uh, which makes this, this series possible. Now, today's discussion is with Rear Admiral John Hill of the U.S. Navy, who is currently the Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, Admiral Hill is a surface warfare officer, and he's previously served as the Program Executive Officer for Integrated Warfare Systems. He previously served with MDA as Technical Director for the Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense Program, and, and as major program manager for the Aegis Combat System. He's held a number of other leadership uh, and acquisition engineering positions, uh, but suffice to say, I think he's uniquely well suited uh, to addressing our topic today, which is some maritime dimensions of ballistic missile defense, and in particular, how the Aegis program uh, fits into all that. Uh, Admiral Hill is a friend of the CSIS Missile Defense Project. Uh, he was here in the spring, I think, to talk about uh, space. Uh, and so, John, thank you for coming back, and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Floor is yours. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, they mic'd me up. Travis, thank you very much. And I've got this awesome microphone here, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, it, it's really uh, great to be here. I'd like to thank uh, my, uh, my old mentor from the U.S. Uh, Naval Institute, uh, the good Admiral. Uh, thank, thank you, sir, for, for teaming up uh, with me today, and uh, Dr. Carrico uh, from the CSIS. I uh, see a lot of uh, friends out there, so uh, that's always comforting when you come over for a lunch hour and you can stare out and look at wonderful Washington, D.C. I'm down in uh, Fort Belvoir. Uh, at the headquarters of the Missile Defense Agency, so the good uh, uh, General Greaves, our director, uh, sends his regards. And um, you know, if he if he could be here, I'm sure he would be because he enjoys a great view like I do too. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the ballistic missile defense writ large, uh, the, the the system as we call it. And then I will also kind of because it's a maritime security discussion, I'll kind of go back to my roots, uh, which is an Aegis program and standard missile. That that's really where I grew up and spent uh, nearly all of my career. Um, when I was uh, an operational guy, I was a combat systems guy, and then all of my tours in the engineering world have been tied to either Aegis uh, or a complex combat system or, or standard missile or ESSM and all those other things. And so I'll try to not speak a whole lot in acronyms and uh, alphabet soup for you, uh, but um, we'll just see how it goes. I'd like to kind of kick it off uh, today uh, just by showing you a video. This is kind of uh, a recent video that we built uh, within the Missile Defense Agency. It'll kind of give you a soup to nuts kind of view where we, where, what we've been doing over the last year. Uh, I reported last year at about this time. And so I, I will tell you the, the test battle rhythm within the Missile Defense Agency is, uh, is impressive. Uh, I did a lot of testing uh, when I was with the Navy. Um, but uh, I will tell you that um, uh, being able to see every layer of the ballistic missile defense system operational and uh, you know, hitting the mark and meeting all of our objectives has been very good. It does a lot to, to build the confidence of the United States. It does a lot to build the confidence of our allies and friends. And a big part of what we do is with the Navy. We have an incredible uh, uh, relationship uh, and coordination with the Navy. And uh, as Dr. Carrico mentioned, I have worked on both sides. I was a missile defense Aegis guy and I was the Navy's Aegis guy uh, as a program manager back in the day. So it's kind of fun seeing life uh, through the services lens and then coming over to the agency and seeing it there. And so to me, I think I'm perfect well suited to be in the job. So anyways, let's, uh, let, let, let's roll to the video.
okay. So we have that crazy soundtrack in there to keep me from talking, uh, but, but it does, um, it, the, I would have loved to have narrated some of those to you, uh, particularly if you hadn't uh, seen some of those, uh, but I'll, I'll kind of talk through them as, as we walk uh, through the view graphs and happy to answer any questions from you if you saw something in the video that uh, uh, got you excited. Um, so I'll, I'll start off with um, a chart that we use um, uh, whenever, pretty much any time I, I give a briefing, I like to remind everybody uh, from the viewpoint of the President of the United States and what he sees as the criticality uh, of the ballistic missile defense system, not only for the regional aspects of it to uh, protect our deployed uh, forward, our forward deployed forces and our allies, but uh, for homeland defense, obviously, to take care of, uh, of our own citizenry. Uh, SecDef, uh, very focused in um, on moving things very quickly. Uh, the chairman and the joint staff, uh, equally concerned about the, uh, the importance of defense uh, for the country. And then, of course, uh, our boss and the MDA is aligned under the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and that is uh, Ms. Lord. And she is all about speed. And so we see all of this as good. Uh, the takeaway box is, uh, is a quote from uh, General Greaves, uh, the director of the Missile Defense Agency. You know, we, we, can, um, we can decide to, to be a little lazy and say, hey, well, we're, we're, uh, we're constrained by dollars or we're constrained by time. We can't move fast enough. The processes drag us down. We can come up with every excuse in the world to not deliver warfighting capability uh, you know, to, to our sailors, Marines, and airmen. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're just not interested in doing that. Uh, we try to move as fast as we can to, to get that capability into the hands of the sailors. Um, so I'll, I'll talk uh, more about that uh, as we go. Uh, next chart, please. So this is the, uh, the mission of the Missile Defense Agency. There, there's kind of three uh, main points uh, to it. Uh, it's a layered ballistic missile defense. And so what that means, it's not all about ground-based missile defense. It's not all about Patriot. And it's not all about THAAD. It's, it's not all about Aegis uh, ships or Aegis ashore. It is a integrated system of systems. And, and that's really what we're, we're charged to do. And that, that is our mission to, to bring them all together. And I'll talk about that uh, as we go through. Uh, taking care of the United States and its deployed uh, forces, allies, and friends to protect us from ballistic missile attacks. Uh, that is the main focus uh, of the mission. And then all phases of flight. And I'm going to walk you through those phases of flight and show you the kind of capabilities that, that we have uh, to, to deal with that uh, here in just a bit. Uh, you see some great pictures there. Of course, Admiral Daly's uh, favorite picture is the mighty destroyer on the upper left-hand side. Uh, the one that I get asked about a lot uh, is that big golf ball on the lower right. Uh, that's our C-band, uh, our S-band, I'm sorry, our X-band C-based radar uh, that we keep out in the Pacific uh, to do a lot of the discrimination work uh, for those, the, the kind of trajectories that, uh, that might come into the CONUS. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, so the video talked a little bit about the threat. Uh, if you read the paper, gee, about every day, you're, you're going to see something here. Uh, I would tell you that our adversaries are moving very quickly. And uh, it is very concerning, which uh, has, has led to uh, this, bed, this, this more um, advanced sense of urgency that we have at the Missile Defense Agency that we have within the Department of Defense, because it is a very fast uh, moving threat and it's getting more complex uh, every day. And so it's not one that is static, it's one that uh, we monitor on a daily basis. Uh, and it's, um, it's concerning, and uh, we're going to continue to pace and outpace and defend against uh, these different threat types. Uh, what you see along the top is uh, what's happening out in the Pacific. Again, uh, that, that one's out in the news. Uh, and then certainly uh, what's, what's occurring uh, that could be a, a threat to the European uh, continent uh, uh, within the Middle East, uh, the, that, that threat in that area. Uh, it's advancing. Uh, we're watching that very closely. And then the emerging threat is a really interesting one that I think we'll get into uh, a little bit more um, when we actually sit down with uh, Dr. Carrico because it, uh, it is a different kind of threat. It's not purely ballistic. Um, so it certainly uh, starts that way, but it ends a little bit differently. And so it's, it's a challenge uh, for any defensive system. Anything that goes uh, at those kind of speeds uh, is a real challenge uh, to any system. Uh, but we're going to uh, continue to move out to address it. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, so the, if you were to ask me what our priorities are, there are three very simple priorities. The first one is continue focusing in on building in reliability, right? We want to continue to build the confidence of the warfighters that use the systems that, uh, that we provide and that we support in coordination with the services. And so very important uh, to do that. And, uh, and I know Admiral Daly uh, thinks that's a big thing. In fact, I think the first time we met Admiral, you were at Fleet Forces Command, and we, we had a, a huge, what I would call a uh, reliability problem uh, in the Navy uh, for the Aegis Fleet. We had allowed it to an atrophy to a level uh, that was just um, unacceptable uh, by any warfighter. And the warfighter I had to face at the time was Admiral Daly. So it's, uh, it's great to see you again here, sir. 
Uh, our second uh, uh, priority is uh, increasing our engagement uh, capability and capacity. Um, as with the first one, and it's true on this one, even though it says engagement capability and capacity, you don't engage unless you can see it. So I, I tend to speak in the, the terms that I grew up with in, in the Aegis program, which is detect, control, engage. So you detect with your sensors. So sensors are critically important uh, to the fire control loop. You control, that's everything from tasking the sensors to initializing the weapon, and then you launch the, uh, the missile or the interceptor. So that's detect, control, engage. And so if you're gonna increase your capacity, you need to kind of worry about all of those pieces because a missile doesn't launch itself, a sensor doesn't do you a lot of good if you don't have a missile that's paired with it. And if you're not controlling it, and if you don't have command and control, and that typically is where the warfighters uh, touch the system, uh, then you have a problem. So uh, we look at increasing capacity and capability across all those major areas. And then addressing the advanced threat, I kind of talked about that uh, gnarly threat uh, on the right, uh, but I will tell you that the ballistic threats are becoming more and more complex uh, with time. And uh, so we will, I'll, I'll get into some of the details of what we're gonna do in just a bit. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, so this is, uh, when, when we talk about the ballistic missile defense system, this is the system uh, that, that we're describing. Uh, this is what I call the placemat. Uh, when I wanna torture my wife and children, I bring this home, and I, I make them repeat back to me, and I say, what is that going across the center of the chart? And my 12-year-old daughter will say, that is a Keplerian trajectory. I said, very good, sweetheart. That's exactly what that is, because that's what a ballistic track does. All right, so, so that's what it's showing there, and we all know as the threat progresses, it's not going to always do that, right? There are now capabilities that can allow these, uh, these kind of threats to do a range extension in space, which means it's really no longer ballistic, and then once it enters the atmosphere, if it goes into a maneuver, that's a different kind of threat, and that's, a, and that's just different than what we've dealt with historically, and so we have to continue to improve uh, the, the ballistic missile defense system because that uh, beautiful Keplerian trajectory isn't so beautiful anymore. Uh, I mentioned uh, detection with the use of sensors. Uh, so we are using uh, space surveillance. We are using terrestrial-based uh, radars. We are using ship-based radars, which I will talk about a lot more towards the end of the brief. Uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, the sea-based X-band radar. Um, you can't, uh, you can't uh, shoot it unless you can see it. So the sensors are important. Uh, command control, battle management, communication, C2BMC, that's what ties it all together. So when I say detect, sensors, control, that C2BMC uh, on the missile defense agency side, and then engage. And those are the engagement systems that you see across the, uh, the trajectory. So when I, when I talk about layered defense, this shows you what layered defense uh, looks like from a really kind of a conceptual or, or an architecture perspective. It also lays down all phases of flight. So you see that uh, depending on where you place the ship and why I'm so excited about talking about the maritime security environment is the flexibility that any country has with its ships. The fact that you can put a big radar on a ship and you can move it where you need it and you can position that ship so it can get an early detection. You can also place that ship at the end game of where one of those trajectories would be to see it as it comes in so that you can engage in the end game. So you can engage early and engage often, which is what we like to do. Um, so, so that's the Asija ship on the left side. We've also taken that capability and we've moved ashore. And so we have uh, that capability operational today in Romania and we're moving out to make that operational in Poland. Um, so we have uh, two sites in Europe. Uh, we're in discussions now with other countries uh, who are interested in bringing Aegis ashore capability. Um, it's fantastic, it is the same. It's basically the top side of a destroyer and, and, and I'll show you some pictures a little bit later and, and it looks a lot like that. Um, some of the missile systems that, uh, that will come out of a VLS system in addition to strike weapons and, and other uh, defensive weapons. On the, on the MDA side of the house, uh, uh, we, we look at the sea-based terminal low weapon, the SM-6, which is on the right, and I'll talk more about those missile families uh, in just a bit, um, and the, the SM-3, which is our what we used to call upper tier versus lower tier. It's really exo-atmospheric engagements versus endo-atmospheric engagements. Um, SM-3, SM-6 is what we load out uh, for the ballistic missile fight. Um, out of scale, the ground-based uh, interceptor, they're, they're, that's what we use to defend the homeland. And uh, that's a very, very large missile that is not to scale. If I were to draw it to scale, it would be sticking out of the top of the, uh, of the screen there. Now, THAAD, uh, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, uh, that uh, system is rapidly deployable around the globe. And we've got it deployed in uh, two, uh, two key areas uh, today. And uh, the, we'll, we'll support the combatant commanders on whatever they need from a missile defense agency uh, perspective. Uh, we, we do the development, working very, very closely uh, with the Army to deploy those systems. And then the Patriot, uh, owned and operated uh, by the Army. Uh, coordination uh, within those regional systems of THAAD and Patriot uh, and Aegis ships, uh, it's pretty amazing uh, what we can do uh, for very specific uh, regions. Uh, 
So, all right, so that's kind of the, the roll-up of uh, the main elements of Detect, Control, Engage. Uh, next chart, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna kinda take you into the Aegis ballistic missile defense world. Um, most of you know that Aegis was really built all those years ago to be an air defense ship. So we started off with the cruisers and uh, ships with uh, you know, doubled uh, deck houses with the spy radar and you know, like any great program, you deploy capability, you learn a lot and you continuously improve. We did not think back in the 70s and 80s that we would be tracking objects in space and that we would be shooting objects in space. But there was robustness built in that system that allowed us to really fully exploit uh, the capabilities of the SPY-1 radar, which is the radar we've been working on for 40 years. All right, so I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about the radar we're going to be working on for the next 40 years, which is the air and missile defense radar, or what we call the SPY-6 that will be on the Flight 3 destroyer. So what, what that allows us to do with a big sensor and really qualified, incredible sailors on board and officers uh, is to place that ship wherever the combatant commanders need it, wherever the Navy needs to deploy those ships, and sense what we have to sense. And in the case of homeland defense, a lot of folks forget that Aegis has a homeland defense uh, role because if that ship is properly placed up forward, it gets an early detection and it can cue the ground-based missile defense. And that's when, when we say long-range surveillance and track, that's what we're referring to is when we have a ship in the Sea of Japan that's looking in the right area, can pass that track data to the ground-based missile defense system to expand the battle space of that system. It allows them to detect a lot earlier and to shoot earlier. So, so that's what the, the upper, uh, upper picture is. Now for regional defense, these ships are going to operate in really tough, tight choke point areas, which is a Navy mission. That's exactly what we do. They're going to operate in the, in the broad open ocean. They're going to operate off the coast of the United States. They're going to operate off the coast of wherever we have an issue and wherever we need to be. And the ships do that fundamental operation of detecting the, the, uh, the threat, uh, controlling uh, you know, that engagement, and getting the missile ordinance on target, as we used to always say uh, you know, back in my Navy days. I'm not sure if I can say that anymore within the Missile Defense Agency, since we're a hit-to-kill organization. Uh, but um, what, what's that showing you is that regional is really our, our focus in on protecting our forward deployed forces, uh, protecting and working with our allies. And so Aegis is not a, uh, a U.S.-owned uh, entity all by itself. Uh, we have uh, lots of international partners, and there are countries that own and operate Aegis, and we operate together. And I'm going to talk to you about a, a very recent exercise we did in the European theater uh, with multiple countries, not just with Aegis ships, but with a range of different types of combat systems, a range of different missiles, a range of different targets on a very unique uh, test range. And it, it, was, uh, it was great for, for all countries involved, and it did show that we can operate together, which is pretty critical going forward, given how, uh, how intense uh, the world can be at times. Okay, next uh, chart, please. So uh, this is uh, Admiral Johnny Wolf, by the way, is our program director uh, for Aegis Ballistic Missile Defense. He's actually uh, overseas now, uh, going through a major data review of Formidable Shield 17, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, but this is a chart that he takes home to torture his sons. And he'll say, all right, son, what is that in the center? And they'll say, daddy, that's a destroyer. And he says, wrong, that's the top of a destroyer, and it's called Aegis Ashore. Um, so it all starts with the heritage of that ship you see there. Um, in fact, a, an earlier version of this would have shown a mighty cruiser, right? Because the cruisers is where we started with Aegis capability, and we have the destroyers out there in large numbers. We have our cruisers out there, and then we have the, uh, the Aegis Ashore uh, pieces I talked about before. Um, what's really kind of fun about these ships is that we're constantly upgrading them, right? And so uh, any, any destroyer that, that comes by a coast near you, you don't really know what's on that destroyer because there's lots of different flavors of them. Uh, from a high level, the way I think of them uh, in terms of computing capacity, because as the threats increased, as things have gotten harder or more difficult out there, either uh, in specific regions or areas, we will increase the capability of those ships. And what we tend to do is we look at our older ships, I call them mill standard ships. Those are the ships that were built on military specifications way back when, right? So that was kind of the first set. And then there's this second set that was kind of a hybrid set where we started to move into commercial processors to increase our computing capacity. That's the whole reason why we did it, right? We did it uh, faster, better, cheaper, and there's a whole family of those ships out there. And then there's our latest and greatest, which are full commercially operated or commercially um, off the shelf kind of technology that's in those ships that gives them incredible processing power, gives them incredible capability. So you, ha you kind of think of it in those terms. Uh, I don't like to get into baseline nomenclature because it makes everybody's eyes roll in the back of their heads, but um, those are kind of the three, three classes. There's mil spec, there's hybrid, and then there's the COTS or the commercially off the shelf uh, versions of Aegis. The other way to think about it is how we do the processing in the sensor, right? There are the ships that have the straight stick in service signal processor, which is kind of based 
based on the error, the AAW capability that we initially deployed back in the day. Then as we increased our iPhone nomenclature and moved up to the next version, right, we brought in a ballistic missile signal process, which allowed us to, to go in and do more discrimination against a larger threat set, and then eventually got into our combined baseline, which is where we do integrated air missile defense, both the BND mission and the AW mission simultaneously. And we do that by carefully managing the radar. And so in that system, we have the multi-mission signal processor. So not only is it doing air defense with horizon search, it's searching up in space, and it is firing both SM3s, SM6s, and SM2s, and ESSMs, what, whatever weapon it needs. It has a weapon selection logic to go do that, uh, to take on the threat. So those are formidable ships. And um, so to, to me, it's, it's very hard not to be proud of that system. All right, so what's, what's great about the modularity of Aegis and the way that we've even handled the, the computing uh, plant is uh, we can actually extract portions of that out. So when we went to do Aegis Ashore in Europe, uh, we only want to do the BMD capability. We did not want to do strike or AEW, for example, or mine warfare. You don't really need that if you're on land, right? So we just wanted the ballistic missile capability. So we're able to extract that out of what we call a common source library. So the Aegis Ashore uh, that's uh, in Poland and Romania, that is a BMD only system. Right? That's what it was designed and built to go do, but it came from the same common source as our integrated air missile defense ships that are deployed around the globe today. So pre pretty amazing stuff. So, you know, 10 years or so ago, I probably would have been here talking to you about the wonders of open architecture and the promise of it, right? Well, we're, we're like, we're way beyond that now. So we're modular, we are open architected, and we have common source libraries that give us a lot of flexibility on how we do that. We do the same things within our missiles. So we evolved from our SM-2 family. We had an extended range uh, air defense missile that was once called the SM-2 Block 4. We still call them that. But that led to the family of missiles that we call SM-6 now. Same sort of thing, common source library, meaning that we've got code that can be activated in that missile to give it a different mission. So it's primarily out there to do the air defense mission long range, but it can also do a ballistic missile defense uh, uh, capability in the terminal phase, which means we're taking advantage of that high G airframe and incredible performance. And what's really incredible is the work that is behind that radome, the work that the engineers do, the algorithms that allow you to see a fast moving uh, maneuvering target and being able to, to pick that out uh, from something else that uh, may be on the surface of the ocean and kill it. And, and that's, that's the real magic. I always like to turn around and talk about our government uh, activities, our labs, our, our industry, you know, the, the people that just work around the clock to ensure we've got the, the greatest capability possible to give to our sailors. Okay, next chart, please. So I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, some more growth within uh, the Aegis program, uh, coupled with standard missile and, and incredible radars. Um, you know, how do you expand the battle space? Lots of different ways to do that. I talked about the placement of ships. The other way to do it is to exploit offboard sensors, right? So what's ra really great about a ship is it's got the detect, control, and gauge all on one ship. It's got a great radar, it's got a great control system, and it's got any numbers of missiles under those VLS hatches, those vertical launch system hatches. But it can also take a cue from space assets. It can take cues from the ship next door. In other words, if it can't see something on its own radar, but the ship next door sees it, it can pass that over to that ship, and that ship can launch on that, uh, launch on that track. And so that's, the cue is one thing where we just get the track and it tells us to go look, right? The, uh, the launch on remote is when we actually launch the weapon based on that radar data that's coming from another ship, uh, land-based radar, or from a space asset. And then engage on remote means the, the firing ship never sees it because by the time he sees it, you know, it could be too late, uh, but coming from a space asset, from a land-based asset, another ship, or some numbers of ships and getting a fused track coming over the data links to that ship allows it to, to shoot a lot earlier and expand the battle space. So those are kind of the ways I, I think about uh, the way we deal with offboard data, right? So it's organic first, right? We're gonna shoot based off our own sensor, then we're gonna take offboard data to cue that organic sensor, then we're actually gonna launch on that data without having it uh, within our own track store. And then finally, we never actually see it, but we're gonna to launch totally on that, uh, that offboard data. And the only way you do that is by leveraging and harnessing the power of the people uh, because the, uh, the, the kind of engineering that went behind that is nothing short of eye-watering. Okay, next chart, please. I talked about Aegis Ashore, and I already mentioned the fact that uh, it's the top side of a destroyer moving to land. And I mentioned uh, Romania, I mentioned Poland. Uh, that site's under construction now. Romania is operational. What you see in the center is our test site. Uh, what we did very early on is we, we built that site uh, up in the, the northeast of the United States. And then we took it down, and we moved it to Hawaii, and we rebuilt it just to prove that we could do that. Uh, and we, we kept that system there for, for testing, and then we deployed the, the two systems to Romania and to Poland. 
uh, pretty uh, great uh, capability, does a lot uh, for the protection of our friends and allies. Just a perfect example of taking a, a regional capability and deploying that forward. Okay, next chart, please. I mentioned the Flight 3 uh, ship. We call it Baseline 10. I told you I wouldn't talk uh, Aegis Baseline nomenclature, but I can't help it. I am incredibly proud of something called Baseline 9. That's a currently deployed uh, capability that's out there now on the mighty USS John Paul Jones, our combined test ship between the, the Navy and the, and the Missile Defense Agency. I mention that because when you talk about partnerships between the agencies and the service, you know, we get questions all the time, like, gee, why, you know, why can't you work closer with the Air Force or with the Army or with the Navy? Well, we are working so closely that sometimes you just don't notice it, right? So we've got this great test ship out there, all the testing that we do out at uh, the Pacific Missile uh, Test Facility or the range facility, PMRF, is done uh, on the USS John Paul Jones, DDG-53, an incredible ship. It's got the latest configuration, the latest deployable configuration. If the fleet needs a deployer, they can go deploy her. If she's available for testing, then we're going to we're going to use her, and uh, we're, we're going to launch targets at her, and we're going to have her shoot them down uh, in a combined integrated air missile defense mode. That's what we're doing on John Paul Jones. Now, what we plan to do, not too far in the future, because we are, we are wrapping up uh, all of our development testing out in Hawaii, is to put a solid-state radar on that same ship class. And so if you go back and look at the, the history of Aegis, when I mentioned the first cruisers, uh, they were originally, we used to call them strike cruisers uh, back in the day, but they were built on a Spruance hull. So on Spruance hull, uh, that's, that's what your Aegis cruisers are. And so we, we kind of held that risk steady, kept the hull steady, put on the new combat system. Then we went to a new hull type uh, for the destroyers. And then we went from rail launchers to vertical launch la launchers. We went from air defense and regional defense and area defense to ballistic missile defense. We have always evolved the capability on those ships, and no different here. We know that we need that sensor that we're going to work on for the next 40 years, and that is the SPY-6, the air and missile defense radar. And so this is just a picture of it. Uh, what you see in the upper right uh, is the test facility out in Hawaii. That's called uh, Ardell, and, uh, and that's got an array out there that's taking advantage of all the ballistic uh, missile uh, tracks and targets that we launch uh, out in the Pacific. And so that radar goes off and tracks them, and then we're going to integrate that into the Aegis system. We'll call that Baseline 10. It's still going to be an integrated air and missile defense ship, but it'll be a lot more powerful because more power, more sensitivity just gives you more capability. And you can see some of the other things, and, and I'll, uh, maybe I'll save some of the other uh, fun, exciting things uh, for later because the next chart's kind of fun. Let me uh, flip the chart. A little bit more on AMDR. The way I think about this radar is it's kind of the radar that the Navy has been wanting and needing for a long time. Uh, this allows us to, to scan the surface, pick up periscopes, right? Uh, Take, take those tracks and blend them with our undersea warfare picture, you know, have that full uh, view, uh, move, move those, uh, those um, uh, beams uh, up further uh, from surface tracks, get into air tracks, get to space tracks, control aircraft. Um, it, it's, um, it's a pretty formidable uh, capability uh, just from the solid state perspective and the kind of flexibility you have. Uh, you see something called network, uh, non-cooperative uh, target recognition there, dedicated tracks, AW uh, volume search. Uh, full face horizon search. There's just a lot of capability that comes forward with more power, more sensitivity, and just the latest technology. And so, pretty key uh, for the Navy. And uh, this radar, this ship, will be a part of the ballistic missile defense. We call it Increment 6. And so, as we track through uh, the, the evolution of the ballistic missile uh, defense system, uh, AMDR is part of that. Uh, next chart, please. So what, what are we really doing uh, within the agency? Uh, if you were to ask General Greaves, he would tell you, you know, John, all that stuff was really, really exciting that you just talked about, but those missiles are really expensive. And uh, I want to get on the right side of the cost curve. And so we, when you look at where we're going in terms of technology, uh, innovation, where we're going with uh, maturing technology, it is about getting on the right side of the cost curve. And so uh, we have our ground base uh, Reliability uh, that I talked about earlier, we're moving to make sure that we can do kill assessment early so we know if we've shot it with one missile, no need to shoot a second missile. Uh, multiple kill vehicles, a little picture on the right there, rather than having one singular kill, kill vehicle uh, you know, on, on a missile stack, uh, have multiples so that we can take on, again, this increasing uh, threat complexity. We've, we've got to deal with that. I mentioned enhancing the radar coverage, uh, advanced discrimination. That's the hard work that uh, our engineers do to make sure that we can pick out the lethal object. Because if you ever look at what happens when you launch a ballistic missile, and you see it in the news when you see some of these shots, right, there's, there's stuff flying off all over the place, right? If it's solid fuel, it does something called chuffing. There's little bands that hold the boosters together. It's just spitting stuff everywhere, right? Well, our radars like that stuff, and so it just tracks it all, 
right? So it's very important for us to be able to tell what that is. And so that's what discrimination really is, is just picking out the lethal object. And then you get to, to more advanced sensors uh, downstream. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of fusion of, of different types of uh, uh, radar bands and infrared, and, and we, we blend all that together to get a fusion. And then we get to a boost phase intercept. And, and that's just a hard one because you kind of have to know, you have to be able to get sensing a time frame on it for, for a, a good amount of time and develop a track and kind of know where it's going and be um, positioned uh, right to take it on, but that's coming downstream. And so really what we're doing is in parallel with our kinetic interceptors, we're making lots of investments in, uh, in directed energy so that we can get up out of the atmosphere where you spoil the beam and put a beam uh, on, on a boosting object and, and take it out. Okay, next chart, just about done here. Tommy, am I going way over time? Okay. And I get to slow down. Um, international cooperation. I, I won't spend a lot of time here because I've kind of touched on all of those. This is a larger ballistic missile defense system view. Uh, we do a lot of work in Asia and the Pacific. I mentioned uh, the, I didn't mention actually, one of our missile types, the SN3 Block 2A. It's, uh, I used to call it the full caliber SN3 because it takes up the full amount of space within a vertical launching system. It's a cooperative development with Japan. And those of you who've ever worked on a cooperative program, it's different than the foreign military sales. You're actually working together. That's really cool, and so, but it's also hard because you, you know, hey, you're, you're oceans apart from each other, and you have different technologies, and you're bringing them together, and there may be a language barrier, uh, but we did it, and it's pretty amazing. We've had uh, some successful flights uh, behind the SN3 uh, Block 2A. Uh, we'll be moving that to production uh, real soon. Uh, I talked about the THAAD deployment uh, in uh, South Korea, uh, again, supporting the Army in their deployments going forward. Uh, we do a lot of joint analysis together with the uh, different countries uh, in the area. Uh, in Europe, uh, I mentioned, uh, I didn't mention the European Phase Adaptive Approach, that's what EEPA stands for, and, and behind that is uh, Aegis Ashore and the ships that we deploy to that area. And I've got my next slide, we'll talk about the uh, Formidable Shield uh, 17 that I mentioned earlier. And then in the Middle East, you know, another different region, unique and different, and so the way that we have uh, worked that out there and working with the Israelis and our future FMS engagements is about building those kind of architectures that are, that are right uh, for, for that part of the, uh, the world. And you see the, uh, the range of cooperative uh, programs uh, across the bottom, everything from FMS procurements all the way back to doing studies together, doing cooperative developments, and it really is about uh, sharing ideas and then eventually operating together, which is the chart I wanted to get to. Next chart, please. So, busy chart, don't try to read it. Uh, what this basically says is uh, we brought together how many nations? Eight nations. We had 14 ships and over 3,000 people out on the Hebrides Range uh, off the coast of Scotland. Um, and we always picked the best time of the year to do it because uh, it was cold and it was windy. Uh, but we had the ships on, on station and we, we fired a number of different types of shots. Uh, they, they were air defense targets. They were U.S. built targets. They were French built targets. They were Italian built targets. And we controlled them all from the same range. We launched ballistic missile targets. And all the ships, regardless of their combat systems, were either tracking and passing data to each other or we were engaging and operating together. And it was pretty amazing. In some cases, we just uh, pushed the data to a, to a different site so we can analyze it to see the quality of a, of, a, of a sensor, how well did that sensor do against that particular target, because we were trying out a lot of new things out there. Um, pretty amazing. And uh, if you look at the number of scenarios there, you'll see some BMD scenarios where they were, whether they are tracking exercises, you'll see integrated air missile defense. We were doing both air defense and ballistic missiles at the same time. Um, just fantastic. General Greaves is an Air Force officer and he was out there and when he came back and said, I'm going to get you a surface warfare officer pen because you are now a sailor because uh, he loved it. All right. Next chart. And this will be my wrap up here. So I'll just end on the priorities. I, I kind of walked you through uh, a little bit on reliability and uh, we could have probably spend all day talking about systems reliability and the importance of it. Uh, increasing engagement uh, capability and capacity. I hope what I left behind to you is not, it's not just about buying more missiles and interceptors. It's about making sure your radars are sustainable. It's making sure that you have the engineering force in place to work those really difficult, complex discrimination problems. It is about getting the high-end interceptors down at a lower price. It's about maturing technology and getting it out there to take on these more complex threats. And so with that, I will thank you for your attention and Tom's coming to give me the hook. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Admiral. That was quite the fire hose of information. Uh, was I that a fire hose? appreciated yeah. the parenting advice for yourself and Admiral Wolf, well, memorizing well, Aegis components. That's, yeah, really, uh, that's really something. Um, let me just sort of kick off with, with what you began with, and that's the threat. Yeah. Um, and I, just, a, just a, a simple question. Is the threat becoming more 
or less ballistic missile focused? And what does that mean for an organization like MDA? Okay, um, so the, you know, I kind of talked about that, uh, that parabolic or the Keplerian um, trajectory, which when, when, you, when you look at that, that's fairly predictable, right? And, and that's kind of how most uh, ballistic missile uh, systems work is you see the launch, you know the angle, so you can kind of predict where it's gonna go. And then you figure out, well, is that my defended area or not? So very predictable kind of shot. And so that's what we're geared to do, right? And that's what activates our systems. If we see it violating a defended area, we're gonna shoot, right? Um, as the threats progress, not only do they become more complex with what's on the front end of that missile, right? And we could talk about that later. But I mentioned the fact that although you're going into space in a ballistic track, you might extend your range in space, right? Which would change your defended area, right? So now we're gonna have to deal with that change in what we used to call the predicted intercept point in my, uh, my Navy time, right? And then if you come back into the atmosphere, if you're not just going straight down to your target, but you decide to maneuver, maybe go around a little bit, maybe speed up, well then that really complicates the fire control system for us. Uh, the Navy was really geared to go do that because uh, we've been doing air defense for a long time and dealing with a lot of what I would call the nasty air defense threat. And what you're seeing is kind of a blend of those really challenging air defense threat with a ballistic profile at the beginning. So you're kind of doing them both. It, it's almost the perfect integrated air missile defense problem to go solve. And that is, of course, what Aegis is in some ways uh, uniquely uh, uh, tailored for. Um, Having spent time both, of course, doing the, the Aegis program for the Navy, but now doing MDA, I wonder if you might reflect on if there are some characteristics of, of Aegis, the, the combat system broadly, that are applicable, there's lessons to be learned and applied to other elements of the BMDS. Right, so I, I think the, the best way to kind of address that is, uh, I, I grew up in a world where we uh, viewed everything as a system. There was no such thing of anybody spending their whole career on standard missile or their whole career in Aegis or their whole career working data links, right? We, we move people around on purpose so that they would understand that there's a total system there. And that total system was about a ship that went to sea um, and had uh, the ability to sense on the surface, sense against air, air threats, and then later sense against uh, the surface threat. So, so we're geared uh, within the Aegis combat system. It's not just Aegis, uh, many of our other systems do it too. Uh, but, but Aegis was really that, that first system that, that looked at that whole volume and said, I've got to worry about that whole volume. And then, hey, is, is in terms of what I have in the vertical launching system, you know, what's the right weapon for that particular part in space? Um, you'll, you'll hear the term a lot about uh, sensor weapon pairing, and that, that's kind of the way that I, I look at it. Is it's really missile selection logic, right? What is the right missile? In some cases, it's the gun, right? What gun do I use uh, for an incoming threat? And it's going to depend if it's a ballistic track, if it's an air breather, if it's a hypersonic, if it's an on-the-deck cruise missile that's maneuvering, and you'll pick the appropriate weapon. Does that make sense? And taking that and applying that to a ballistic missile defense system that is globally dispersed. Um, is, is really what we're doing. And, but those are characteristics that may not exist with THAAD or Patriot or GMD in, in the right. same way that might benefit from. That's right. So, uh, you know, many of the sensors um, that, well, most of them have some sort of heritage, right? So uh, THAAD and Patriot on the Army side for a very specific part of the battle, right? So maybe it was point defense in a, down a particular threat vector. So you only need it, say, a single phase radar. Navy operates with a maneuvering ship, so it's gonna want a, want a 360 degree radar. And so if, if you start to look at it from that perspective and a threat that's gonna maneuver whether you're a ship or a land-based site or not, you probably want to be able to look in multiple different threat axes. And so um, it, that's the great thing about working in a joint environment. Uh, you, you do get different perspectives on how you view things. We have very strong uh, space uh, capability within the Missile Defense Agency, uh, and I, I attribute a lot of that to our folks that work uh, from the Navy side uh, in that area of command and control and links, and then our Air Force friends that, that really work uh, in the space sensor area. So Aegis ships are valuable, scarce resources. Yeah. We have 35 BMD capable sh uh, ships, and uh, two of them uh, are currently uh, been taken out of service. Uh, as you take a look at this again, more from the national perspective, um, you know, there's a lot of tension there. These are ships that do a lot of different missions. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of ref reflect a little bit on, you know, the desirability, the, the trade-offs between as a nation putting more or less of our <coughs> missile defense assets on ships as opposed to other places. Right, so I, I talked before about the, um, just the fundamental utility of a ship that can go where you need it to go 
brings along the radar, brings along the control system, brings along an arsenal of weapons with it. So it's, it's very flexible. It's great for the warfighters to have that kind of capability. Uh, if you've got an area of the world, a region, to where you need persistence of that radar, it would make sense to put a land-based radar in that place and free up a ship to go do all those other missions that, that you mentioned. It also might make sense in some regions where you don't have the island chain to, to put a radar to push your sensors into space to give you a broader coverage of a threat trajectory. Because the other thing about the threat, in addition to doing lots of different things in space and in the atmosphere, is that the ranges are increasing. And you know, you, you'll go out of the radar field of view very quickly if, you're, if you constrain yourself to some number of radars or some number of ships. So I mean, the answer is that you, you want a little bit of each. Okay. So Aegis has, has always been the evolving system. Yeah. Uh, it's going to continue to evolve. And you alluded to some of what's kind of next, SPY-6, uh, the SM-32A, things like that. Um, uh, is there anything else that might just be over the horizon? You know, with seeker, more active seekers, things like that, more capable. Uh, and also, you mentioned Aegis Ashore. You know, is that, it's, Aegis Ashore is not constrained in the same way right. that Aegis Afloat is. And that, could that evolve in a different way? Bigger radars, things like that. Uh, the, the answer is yes to all of that. Um, so um, we're, we're constantly looking at ways to evolve whatever system uh, we might be talking about within the ballistic missile defense system. But from, a, from an Aegis perspective, uh, it is not a big stretch to think that we may want to expand the aperture or the size of the radar at an Aegis ashore site, for example. Not out of question, not in the program of record today, but there may be a reason for us to go do that. We've, we've been asked several times about the Aegis ashore site in Hawaii. Would it make sense to expand the aperture there and use that for defense of Hawaii? Right, so so we, we've looked at that. We'll more than likely do, go down the path of a, of a different site because we, we don't want to shut down range operations at PMRF, for example. Right? So it may make more sense to, to have a, a bigger radar there. Um, as we look at things like multi-object kill vehicles and we look at the commonality of the seekers that we have across, whether it's standard missile or the ground-based interceptor or our new kill vehicle that we'll be putting on the ground-based interceptor, there's, you'll find a lot of commonality. Uh, when I was in the Navy, uh, working across multiple combat systems, where it made sense, we would go common. So we had the first common display system went on an aircraft carrier that was really built for the DDG-1000 that later populated on the Baseline 9 Aegis uh, destroyers, and that, that was really a great thing to go see. So if you look at the BMBS, and, and there's a seeker capability, there are discrimination algorithms, uh, there are signal processors out there that can be shared across those systems, then you really do have kind of a force multiplier, and you, you can use that uh, within the Navy. If it makes sense to put multi-object uh, kill vehicles on a standard missile three variant, then we'll likely go down that path if it makes sense and if those ships are going to operate in an area where that's a threat. Um, so does that answer your question, Tom? And how about in the other direction? I mean, is there, uh, you know, talking about RKV, for instance, I might yeah. ask how that's going and if there's some uh, relationship between today's standard missiles and the RKV. Yeah, so, so we are, that, that's the perfect example of a commonality. If, if you were to go in and unscrew the top of a standard missile and, and you look at uh, particularly the SM3 uh, Block 2A and you, and you look at the kind of sensor package that it has on it and the, the kind of threats it was designed to go after and you ask yourself, is that applicable to what we're doing and would that save us time and, and money within a reliable kill vehicle family? The answer is probably yes. And so we, we are looking at using uh, some of the sensor technology, some of the algorithms that are resonant in a standard missile in a ground-based uh, system. Well, last question, and then we'll, we'll open it up here, and, and that's uh, the ever-elusive quest for integrated air and missile defense. Yes. Uh, in some respects, of course, the Navy's further ahead than, right. than, than other, uh, other services. Um, but there's two parts of that. On the one hand, there's the integration within MDA of integration of different ballistic missile right. defense elements. Uh, and then on the other side, there's the integration of offense and defense. Um, Aegis has a little bit of both of those. And I wonder if you might give a, an MBA perspective on how that's coming, not just Aegis, but, but broadly uh, on both of those pieces. Yeah, the um, moving um, the, taking the B out of, uh, out of ballistic missile defense and, and going back to the name of the organization, Missile Defense Agency, um, really, really kind of drives us to, to have that thinking. The threat is what really drives us, which is why I'm glad you asked the question about do things stay in this beautiful Keplerian thing, and you know, the, the reality is that threat starts to look a lot like a classic air defense threat that I'm used to seeing, you know, from my, my days, uh, you know, working destroyers and cruisers. And so it, it's not a far reach to, you know, and it's really not surprising to me that, uh, you know, MDA was designated as a technical authority for 
integrated air missile defense. But it's also a great story, again, of working closely with the services. Right? We're not going to go do IAMD for Navy ships uh, by ourselves. Right? That's going to be in close coordination with the Navy because they own that mission. Uh, they own the AEW mission within the Navy. And uh, when they take ownership of a baseline nine destroyer, after we work that together with MDA and deploy that ship, they, they own that mission now. So they're executing the ballistic missile defense mission, the integrated air missile defense mission, which brings in AEW. It kind of depends on how you define IEMD, by the way. So technically, we always define it as simultaneous operations of AEW air, air warfare and ballistic missile defense, doing them together. And the reason that was a challenge is we were limited by the radar, right? Did the radar have enough power to, to, to do both missions at the same time? And uh, you know, through lots of hard work, we, we brought those together and we defined it that way. When we did the NATO operations that I talked about, Formidable Shield 17, it's defined a little bit differently. It's as a force, we're doing AW and ballistic missiles together, right? So you don't have to have a ship that can do both ballistic missile defense and air defense. You just may be the sensor for a ballistic missile fight or the sensor that's passing the data and you get into that queued and launch on and engage on remote that I mentioned earlier. So I think there's, depending on the definition, um, I think it's a, it's a right place, which is why we, we work very closely with Sixth Fleet uh, on uh, Formidable Shield 17. We felt like we were the right team to come in and help with that because of our understanding of that, but also because we want to learn from what the operators did out on that test range on those ships with real sailors. Great. Well, okay. we'll take some questions if okay. that's all right. Uh, Great. Folks just want to raise their hand and we'll have some microphones go around. Uh, this gentleman in the middle, uh, wait for the, the mic. Folks would just introduce yourself and uh, and speak into the microphone. My name is John Knowlton. I'm a CIA uh, clandestine service retiree, and I teach uh, political science at Flagler College in St. Augustine. My course is on Russian foreign policy. I've told my students that the number one issue between the U.S. and Russia is uh, Bush's withdrawal from the ABM Treaty. And I've also told them, and I'd like you to comment, that it seems plain to me that the Russians are very happy to have us under threat from missile systems from rogue states, which was the reason that we withdrew from the ABM treaty in the first place, because we couldn't do this otherwise. <clears throat> so the question is, do you agree with that? And number two, are they right when they accuse us of trying to neutralize their offensive capability to attack us or to counterattack with ballistic missiles? You're going to be very disappointed in my answer. So uh, coming from the Missile Defense Agency, uh, which is a development uh, organization that works closely with the services to deploy capability, I don't really get into the policy issues. And I think what you're really asking is, is policy. Um, so I, I can't really answer that. So I'll kick that over to Tom. Tom, you going to take that on? <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, uh, Rose Gottmuller in 2014 in Bucharest uh, said that uh, it's not even a close question. Uh, that we just don't have the, either the capability or the capacity, the numbers, to really affect strategic stability. And it seems to me that barring some technological breakthrough, that's probably going to be the case for the foreseeable future. But uh, the Russians will still put that narrative out there nonetheless. So, all right, why don't we pick some more? Sure. Um, Kingston. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Kingston Reef with Arms Control today. Um, I have a question about the SM3 2A testing program. Um, the FY17 reprogramming request that the administration uh, submitted for additional defense funds and that Congress um, approved in October included an additional 61 million quote for additional SM3 2A testing, end quote. As you may have also seen the conference version of the FY2018 NDAA requires a SM32 a test against an ICBM target by the end of 2020. So my question is, is uh, a test of the SM32 a against an ICBM now part of MDA's uh, testing program for the 2A? Thank you. Thank you, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm familiar with the language. Uh, we, we don't have an appropriation in place uh, yet. Um, so the, it, this would probably be more of a fun conversation uh, a month from now. Um, but uh, I will tell you that, that we, we've looked at that and um, we, we will plan and uh, we are assessing. Uh, but I, you know, really what it would do in the end game is, is allow us to, to expand the, the mission capability of, of the SM3. But at this point, uh, you know, it's not a formal part of our test program yet. All right, who else? Oh, the gentleman in the front. I mean, it, it would also further blur the homeland regional distinction. Hi, thank you. Ben Warner from U.S. Naval Institute News, and you kind of hinted at 
Um, Aegis Ashore, possible locations. Are we any closer to having one in, in Japan, or is there anywhere else that uh, you're looking at in the Pacific? Thanks. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, we, we've uh, been specifically asked uh, by Japan, and we're working with Japan now for them to consider and perhaps make a decision. Uh, but it's too early to, uh, to finalize, because they, they, it'll be their decision, but uh, they haven't uh, gone there yet. And we, we've had talks with, with other countries, but nothing that I, there, there hasn't been any formal uh, you know, request at this point. All right, a couple, couple more um, in, in the front, and then actually we'll start right here. Start right here. Okay, Pauline uh, Sinovets, CNS. Uh, again, coming back to the U.S.-Russian relations, but not about the relations. One of the main accusations of Russians, as for the uh, Aegis Ashore MK-41 launcher, that it can be used for launching the Tomahawk missile, is it uh, close to the truth, or it's uh, it's uh, some kind of exaggeration? Thank you. I, I think I understand. You know, you're asking, uh, is Aegis Ashore in either Romania or Poland? Does it have the capability? to threaten the, the, the Russian Does it have the capability to launch uh, Tomahawk cruise missile? No. No, no, it doesn't, no. So when, when I talked about the ability to extract out from the common source library, uh, that's one piece that we didn't extract out to put into the site uh, in either Poland or Romania. And in fact, uh, you, you could walk in and the consoles aren't there, the control systems aren't there. So when I say detect, control, and gaze, there is no control system. There are no Tomahawks in, the, in those launchers. Okay, thank you. Why don't we move up here? Hi, Admiral. Uh, ben Kessling with the Wall Street Journal. Have we reached a tipping point with North Korean missile, offensive missile technology, where with this latest launch, they have shown to have enough, enough technology packed into that, into that device to just need to replicate that now and to be able to fire more of them? Has there been a, has there been a, a, a tipping point uh, that, that has been reached there? And if not, how far in the future, if, the, if that development continues at the same pace, how far in the future will that will that point come where the offensive technology will outstrip our ability to defend against it? And then follow on to that is, is there too much attention being paid to the uh, magic bullet that people think that is and its, and its uh, placement in, in, in the East? Thank you. So your, your first question is really for the uh, intelligence community to answer. So, so I can't really give you a, a direct question. Um, I will tell you, though, that we're the recipients of a lot of that information, and we constantly assess it. I mean, that, that's how we, we stay ahead of the threat, is working very closely with the intelligence community to, to build out and improve the systems that we have. And I, and I can't say much more than that. Uh, I, I don't know about a tipping point, necessarily. Um, I will tell you that we view with concern what we see as an increasingly complex threat. And you can find complexity in a lot of ways, um, and we're seeing that increase occur. I don't believe that there's, I wouldn't uh, call it a tipping point at this point. I, I would tell you that uh, the, the defense system we have in place today uh, will defend against the threat as we understand it today. It's what we're concerned about is tomorrow's threat as it, it continues to increase, which is why we're, we're taking it very seriously. Reliability, uh, increasing our capability and capacity, and, and lots of focus on the advanced threat and maturing technologies to take that on. Uh, your second question about too much attention, uh, I'm not really sure what the context of that is, too much attention on that. That is an incredible system. I think it's, uh, it was a right decision to, to deploy it to where it's deployed today. Uh, it's got the capability to deal with the threats that are in that region, and I have high confidence, and I think uh, most will tell you that we have high confidence in that system. We uh, start with uh, Tony in the back, and then up here. Hi, uh, Tony Capassi with Bloomberg News. Uh, yesterday, uh, Mellon Lord's office released a list of six pilot projects that she wants to identify for rapid acquisition. Yeah. And uh, cryptically, it said MDA standard missile was one of the six. Can you elaborate a little bit about what missile and what's the approach you're taking, you're going to take that you're not taking now? Um, I, I'm not real familiar. I, I think you're talking about uh, her most recent speech or, or discussion at, at the SASC. Uh, so, so I read that, and, uh, and, and I showed you her, her quote earlier about how she wants us to move very quickly. I think her, her words were, hey, let's get capability uh, downrange uh, quickly. And so we're all in there. I would say we're unique and different from the services. Uh, as you know, we, we've got uh, a different set of acquisition authorities in MBA. And the key thing is, is that the, my general, the, the director, is the head of contracts. So if, you, if, you're, if you're looking at uh, contractual processes to speed up uh, acquisition, 
Uh, we have one man who's accountable who can make those decisions. And I will tell you, you know, having come from the services, um, the, that ability to have the director as head of contracts to make decisions quickly is the decision space that slows you down. And the fact that we've got one person that, that does that makes things move very quickly. And I have plenty of examples, whether it's decisions on technology, decisions on contracts, acquisition strategies, I mean, you name it. The fact that General Greaves is that decision maker within the Missile Defense Agency allows us to move with speed that is very hard to find uh, if you're under a different system. Th does that help, uh, Tony? She's talking sure. about but yeah. broadly what you say is interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, when, when I uh, saw the, the listing, um, you know, I, I can't read her mind. Uh, it could be the fact that we have a pending production decision coming up and we're, we'll, we'll go to contract for production and she may be looking for ways uh, for us to speed up that production because the warfighters need that capability. We want to get it there quickly. So if there's a way to do that, we'll, we'll go do it. If I could uh, underscore, I think a, a hanging thread that, that might be from that is the, the big question of, of, of transfer. Uh, yeah. from MBA to the services of something like FAD. Sure. Uh, if I follow you correctly, uh, supposing that goes through, mm -hmm. the processes for acquisition there might slow down relative to where they are, from MBA's acquisition authority back to the services. Is that fair? Um, well, maybe not. So, so the discussion on transition and transfer, we've had a lot of success there, by the way. So if you look at Aegis Ashore uh, with the Navy, again, that great partnership uh, with the Navy, uh, we very early set down a plan to transition Aegis Ashore which what that really means is you bring the sailors in, they start to operate, we go through all of the inspections, like just like we would do on a ship, and then you do the transfers, so the Navy knows exactly what they're getting and they can operate it, right? Because that, that's, that's my definition of, of, of transfer, right? Navy now owns it and they're gonna go operate it. Uh, with THAAD, it's the same thing. We're, we're not gonna hand over the development of THAAD and, and put that burden uh, on the Army. The Army is ready to operate, they do it today. We're teamed very well with the Army to do operations. Uh, what the discussion on transition transfer is, is to have them take over procurement and take over sustainment of missiles and radars and, and the control systems associated with that. Um, so it's, it's one model. Uh, we, we haven't done it yet uh, for, for, for lots of reasons. Uh, I don't know that it necessarily places the, the program at risk. I just know that either the Army or MDA uh, has a budget problem to deal with when you do that transition. If we don't move the budget over, which is our intent, by the way, to move it to the Army, uh, well, then the Army now will have to decide how many they go by. And, um, you know, so that's, that's really the, the right. and, and I think eventually, uh, you know, part of the uh, research and engineering and the acquisition sustainment uh, separation within the 18L shop, will, that'll probably better define the plan, and then we can, uh, then, then it'll probably make transition transfer a lot easier. So why don't we give the last question uh, to this gentleman right here in the front. Hey, Admiral, uh, Justin Doubleday with Inside Defense. I just wanted to ask about the RKV. Um, obviously, the administration sent over an emergency spending request to begin expanding the GMD program or system, and central to that is the RKV development. To what extent can you move that schedule to the left, the testing and fielding schedule to the left? The, um, the intent would be if we increase the numbers of ground-based interceptors, and, and we won't know until we get the appropriation, right, so I'll start there, um, is that those would be all up rounds that include a reliable kill vehicle. So they, they, they will, um, the redesigned kill vehicle, the RKV. Um, so it has to be just by its own nature, but the timeline of when we're going to deliver those would have to be accelerated faster than the original plan. And uh, it's, it's doable because it, it is a, you know, it's an improvement to the, the existing uh, EKV and it's also the path to get us to MOKV. So it's, uh, we've, got a, we've got a great industri industry team on top of this and uh, we, we, are, we are adjusting right so that we can still meet the, um, you know, uh, fly before you buy kind of thing and make, make sure you test like you fight. And so, so we're looking at those accelerated timelines to make sure that we, we do it right, that we get the requisite number of ground tests and flight tests in so that we can deliver with confidence a, uh, a kill vehicle with a, you know, full up, uh, all up round that the, that the warfighter can trust, increase our uh, reliability, increase the ace of bow to make sure that the shot doctrine uh, can be decreased. Again, it's all about getting on the right side of the cost curve. So, so we're, we're, we're taking a very aggressive stance on RKB. Well, 
Admiral, thank you. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap up? No, I'll, I, I'll just, uh, just because of the maritime security discussion, I'll just uh, reemphasize the incredible partnership uh, we have with the Navy. Um, I was relieved by uh, Admiral Doug Small, uh, who is just a great partner. Uh, he owns uh, the air missile defense radar, working very closely with Admiral Galenis, uh, working the DDG-51 Flight 3 program. That's just one area where, where we're connected. And uh, Ron Boxel, Admiral Ron Boxel over on the OpNav staff, uh, we, we are all connected. And, uh, and Johnny Wolf, of course, who's off doing great things in Europe right now. It's, it's great to be a part of that team. I think it's important for the nation. Uh, it's important for our friends and allies uh, because of the kind of work that we're doing uh, is all about an international force, and it's just a great partnership. So, great. so thanks for the time today, Tom. Well, thank you for coming out. Thanks also to USNI uh, and to our sponsors, and thanks to all of you for a uh, good question. So thanks, all right. Thanks. thanks.